Welcome everybody to today's Door to Store. Today we're talking about watercolours and paintings and what I want to do to start with is look at the similarities and differences between these types of items because that I think gives you a, a better insight in how to care for them. Um, there are quite a lot of similarities but there are really significant differences in them as well. The aim of today's um, session is to really provide you with a better understanding of what these things are um, and also to get a good understanding of the types of problems um, that can affect them and the types of damage that they're vulnerable to. Um, and then in that way, um, you're better able to understand how to care for them. So we'll start with watercolours. Watercolours, well, the term watercolour can refer to a technique of painting. It can also refer to the medium, which is the paint, and it can also refer to the object, a watercolour, similar to this one. Basically, watercolours are made up of generally the support. Now, the support re refers to the, the thing that the image is painted onto. So in the case of watercolours, that is most often paper, but it can also be vellum. Um, in the case of botanical illustrations, a lot of artists use vellum, um, and there are a number of other um, supports that are used. I'm going to deal mainly with paper because that is the most common one that you'll come across. Then you've got the um, paint itself. The paint, um, we're dealing with really quite traditional materials. Watercolour painting is, is quite old and dates back many centuries and probably right through to sort of some of the cave paintings, they may have had a, a watercolour medium. So basically the watercolour paint is made up of a pigment, um, a binder, and the binder is generally um, gum arabic, which is a, a, a gum that's sourced from acacia trees. Um, that they've also in the past used honey and sugar and various things like that. Basically something that's fairly light, water soluble and will dry and hold the pigment to the paper. Um, there are other things that have been put into watercolours but basically those are the, the main components of a watercolour um, paint. Watercolour paint is essentially transparent. Um, it does not have an opaque pigment in it. Uh, when it has opaque pigment in it, um, something like lead white or titanium white, it's called body colour, or gouache. And gouache tends to be a bigger pigment um, gra granule um, along with the opaque paint. When we're looking at paper, the support, we're looking at a material that is organic, it's made from cellulose. It's made up of a lot of cellulose fibres um, mashed up um, and, and processed in a way that we get individual fibres. To make paper, you have about 5% paper fibre, 95% water, and um, it's, pulled, it, it's, it's basically a felting process. Um, a mould is pulled through in the traditional um, paper making um, technique, a mould is pulled through the water, the fibres rest on the mould, the, the, the water drains away and you have a sheet of paper. That's obviously um, become um, mechanised and, and mass produced, uh, but the principle is basically that. Paper is then sized so that it doesn't remain like blotting paper, so that it can take ink. And watercolour paper, specialty watercolour paper, is manufactured so that it has a bit of absorbency but it, that it's stable in, in um, water. If you get a piece of photocopy paper or printing paper and you um, get a paintbrush and brush across on water, you'll find that the paper will cockle and that's the distortion that we get when, when it it's, um, has moisture on it. Watercolour paper doesn't do that, so it's actually specially made for watercolour painting. One of the things about paper is that in traditional paper making, it was made with fibres that had um, quite a lot of stability. Um, it, chemically. Uh, more modern papers tend to be made from cheaper fibres and um, much more mass produced once they introduced um, chemical bleaches and um, different sizes um, to paper. We got a lot more deterioration. So from the sort of industrial revolution on, we've had We've still had good quality paper, but the bulk of the paper we have that we use every day is a much poorer quality than the older traditional papers. So there's an inherent weakness in some of the papers that we come across there. We've also got um, the pigments and the, and the um, binders in the, 
in the um, watercolour medium that can cause problems. I'll talk about that a little bit later um, when we come to look at the, the types of problems we have. Looking at paintings, we're looking at a very different, um, in many ways, very different type of object. A painting is a much more complex structure. And in some ways, I would say that there's probably a lot more variations in paintings. So we still have a support, but we have multiple layers in this, in a painting. Now, the supports in paintings traditionally um, have been a board, and often a timber board, or the one that I think most people are very familiar with is canvas, a linen canvas. There's lots of variations on this, particularly in modern times where people are painting on masonite. I have one here, um, which is painted on masonite, and I can see that when I examine this painting quite closely, because I can see the texture of the masonite underneath the paint layer. Um, so we have a huge number of variations. Given that, I'm going to really concentrate on the most common ones that we come across, um, and that will be the canvas. So when we have a canvas painting, um, we have a painting on canvas, sorry, we have the canvas layer. Um, then on top of that, there is a priming layer. Now the priming layer is put on there to stabilize um, and to also create a layer on which the, the paint can be applied, a smooth layer. If we didn't have the priming layer, and there are a number of, sometimes a number of layers uh, before the paint is put on there, if we don't have that, we get the texture of the canvas. And so in some paintings where you have very, very delicate detail, that would, be, that would interrupt the aesthetic of the painting. So there can be sometimes a couple of layers of those. Now that traditionally is something like a gesso, so quite a chalky white layer applied, and that's applied with the, um, a white pigment, um, usually in a rabbit skin glue. Um, again, quite traditional materials, um, although more, more recently we're getting acrylic um, grounding layers. After that, um, you have your painting layer. And that can be, in the case of something like this one, um, a fairly flat surface, um, paint applied um, to the surface, or in the case of this one here, we've got very deep layers of paint and paint protruding from the surface. And that's very important. That's um, a technique called impasto, and that creates a, a, a real texture in the painting. But it can also, if on canvas, have, have some issues um, in terms of the thickness of the paint um, and how that might behave. On top of that, you generally have a varnish layer. The varnish um, creates a surface that allows the light to reflect in a certain way. It deepens the colour. Without the varnish layer, the colour doesn't appear as bright, um, as vivid. Um, the varnish layer is also um, smooths out some of the imperfections in the paint layer. There's not always a varnish layer. Um, there's a number of modern paintings that are very, very deliberately um, very matte. And they don't necessarily have a varnish layer, they may have a matte varnish, but they have significant problems in terms of conservation because of that matte surface and they can be quite problematic to, to deal with. Now on this painting, um, we have a small area that has no varnish on and it probably won't be picked up by the camera, I suspect. But just down in this little area here, there's an area that's dull, that doesn't have a sheen and it's quite a different surface. One of the things that happens with the varnish layer is that it can very much discolour and you see in um, accounts of um, pay, restoration, conservation of old masters and particularly things like the ceiling on the Sistine Chapel, um, a real difference once the, the deteriorated and discoloured varnish is taken away and replaced by a new varnish. In addition to that, paintings can also have glazes and glazes can be coloured additions over the varnish or within the varnish layer or on top of the varnish and before another varnish layer is put on, uh, depending on the technique the artist is using. 
that adds depth and three-dimensional feeling to the, to the painting can also add very subtle hints of colour. And because it's separated and, and uh, on top of the painting, it actually um, really enhances the aesthetic. So they're very, very complex, can be very, very complex um, uh, pieces of, of art. Um, and in terms of the technicality of them and in looking at them, examining them and knowing how to conserve them, um, Many, many paintings are quite difficult to, to, to work on. A lot of research has to go into them. Equally, with watercolours, um, a conservator looking at a watercolour has to really understand what the watercolour is about, what techniques have been used, what pigments are there, um, and just really um, the sorts of paper that's been used, etc. That's why any work on... on paintings and watercolours, I, th I would always advise if you're sort of going down the track of doing anything other than just basic preservation that you always get a conservator's advice and also um, perhaps get a conservator to treat it for you. But there's a lot you can do to look after these things yourself. I want to look at um, just some of the, the types of damage um, that that you can come across with both of these items, um, the, the sorts of things that are problems. And we've got some really good examples on the table here. A lot of the damage you get, conservators are always talking about relative humidity, temperature and light. Um, and <laughs> We're going to talk about them again <laughs> because they are really important in terms of just how you care for things. Um, the principal damage you get with any cultural heritage material is physical and chemical, and often both in combination. And the physical um, is really fairly obvious in many cases, and I think this is a really lovely example of some of the typical um, physical damages you get on paper. You can see around the edges we've got a lot of missing areas. We've got tears, we've got dog ears, we've got these folded bits, lots of tears throughout. Now, I'm not wearing gloves. I'm going to just take a, make a note on that. Um, gloves are important to wear if you're handling things. Um, they prevent oils from your hands getting onto items. Equally, um, when conservators are working on items, they often do not wear gloves. For a conservator working on something, particularly where you've got paper, where it might be brittle or delicate, um, it's really important that we can feel what we're doing. Um, cotton gloves um, were very popular for handling paper, and there's been a lot of talk about gloves or no gloves in libraries. Um, cotton gloves can actually prevent you feeling um, having the sensitivity of feel that you need to un uncurl curled paper, brittle paper, etc. So I do have a box of gloves here, and I would say um, if you are going to handle works of art, um, nitrile gloves are actually very good. Um, they do prevent oils getting onto um, objects, and this is really important when you're dealing with metals. Um, so I think it's really... it's, it's we get a lot of questions about gloves or no gloves, so I think that's an important one to add. So just on this particular item, we've got a lot of physical damage, but I said that the physical and the chemical are actually quite often um, interrelated. Now, in these, it, there's a number of areas here where we can see discoloration, and particularly around the edge here, there's a, a, a darker brown discoloration. And that, to me, indicates that the the paper has been affected by light or by contact with an acidic mount. And that has caused that to become acidic. So looking at the structure of paper, we have a lot of... I'm going to just use this as a little, little example. This is a paper fibre, so it's a big cellulose fibre. Um, it's a... Um, they're made up of... They're, they're long strings. Um, and when they're in touch with an acidic um, board, the acids can migrate into the into the paper. If it's a poor quality paper, contact with light or light falling onto it, UV light particularly, um, can set up a chemical reaction which breaks the fibres. So basically, the fibres get shorter. So when you've got a felt of lots of fibres that are interlinking and are held together by um, what we call hydrogen bonds between the fibres, as these fibres get shorter, 
your felt loses strength. The strength in the paper goes. So we, get, we start to get brittle paper. And I think this is very typically illustrated by um, newspapers that have been left out in the sun or old newspapers you might find in your home. You can pick them up and bits just flake off. That's very, very indicative of, of um, uh, that chemical damage to the paper fibres. So that chemical damage has led to some of these pieces falling off. There's a combination in here of poor handling, I can see creases, etc., but also of these um, chemical damage leading to, to problems with the paper. This little watercolour, well, it's a mixed media because we've got some white here, um, some strong white. Um, you can see these little brown spots all the way through. Now, you often see these on paper items and you often see them on watercolours. It's called foxing and that's based on the colour of the stain. Um, it's thought that foxing is caused by mould in paper. There's also been theories that it's cause, caused by um, little tiny fragments of metal that have come from the paper making process. Um, there's also theories that it's a combination of the two. With foxing it can be treated. Um, one of the problems with treating foxing is that it's a bleaching process and bleaching can cause damage to paper because it's quite a, a severe chemical um, treatment. Um, so the, the other thing about it is that it can be quite an expensive treatment because we have to um, treat every individual spot. Um, with the bleach. Um, now, many conservators are using um, milder bleaches these days if they are bleaching, but often we get the decision not to do anything at all with these sorts of things. So that's quite a, quite a common thing you'll see in watercolours. Um, this one also, um, one of the things about watercolours is that generally you don't have white um, you don't use a white pigment. As I say, that then becomes a mixed media. So the white in a watercolour is generally the paper showing through. And that's... They, and, and, and watercolour artists use the texture of the paper and the behaviour of the pigments to create certain effects. In this area in the sky, and this is very typical on watercolours, this is not white. Now, the paper may not be absolutely pure white to start with. It may not be our what we see as modern, in modern paper as being very, very white. Um, but generally, watercolour paper is pretty white. In this case, we have discoloration. And that could have been caused by a number of things. Um, it's often caused by exposure to light. So that something is in a frame, it's displayed for a long period of time, the light with UV components falls on it, sets up a chemical reaction and it starts to, to discolour. That can also cause fading of the pigments. I don't have a good example of fading of pigments here at the moment, but in many cases we have we take watercolours out of frames and you'll see very strong colours round the edges where it's been covered up by the mount and in the middle it's much, much paler. This is very, very typical and a really good sign that... Um, um, well, a really good lesson in not exposing things to UV and to direct sunlight because that cannot be reversed. So this discoloration here, quite typical. This here, the darker discoloration here um, that, that appears on some of these areas may be because of um, exposure to light. It may also be something that's in the paper. Some of these deterioration reactions can be quite complex. I'm just going to talk about um, deterioration to paintings. Um, before coming back to some of these as well. Um, we've got some really good examples here of um, problems with paintings, and it's mainly on this, this little fella here. At the bottom of this painting, I'm just going to hold it up like this, we've got a lot of loss of paint along there. We believe that this was um, in a situation where the, the bottom of the painting got wet and remained wet for a period of time. And so that the layers, the various layers that I described, um, the, the primer layer, the ground layer and the paint layer, have started to delaminate. There are a number of different ways that, that these things can delaminate. Um, and one of them is movement of the canvas. If the canvas um, is handled badly, um, if it's... Um, if it, it moves with fluctuations in relative humidity, we can get the delamination. And that's a really good example. 
We've got a lovely little hole here. I'll try and illuminate that. I don't know whether it's, no, it's not quite, it's, it's near the stretcher. Oh, you can just see it, I think, just down there. Um, it's actually a puncture hole. And it's surprising how often paintings get damaged um, by broom handles and various other things as people walk past, um, not realising how far their broom handle or their backpack or whatever extends and um, bashing into the painting. Um, and that can cause, um, that's, a, that's a real dent in the painting and has, has broken through all layers. Um, so that's a, a real sort of, um, just an awareness issue that people have to be very careful. Uh, we've also got another little piece down here, which hopefully we can show, where we've lost all layers except for the canvas. From where I stand here, I can see the, um, the threads of the canvas, where all the layers on top of the canvas have, have gone away. And that um, would not necessarily have been due to the same um, causes that we had the delamination down here. This is probably more likely uh, movement in the canvas at some time or some sort of nick in the, in the canvas. So I touched on relative humidity there and the movements um, that can cause problems with the canvas. Relative humidity, fluctuations in relative humidity are one of the key things that can cause problems for both watercolours and, and um, paintings. Particularly water paintings where, where the standard way that we mount canvases is to put them on a frame, a wooden frame, a stretcher or a strainer. Now there's a difference between a stretcher and a strainer. A strainer is, if we look at the top half of this painting, a strainer is like that. It has no, nothing in the corners there that could mean that you can adjust the, adjust the canvas. Um, so that remains at a certain um, tension. And when we get um, changes in relative humidity, timber and canvas react differently to relative humidity. Timber will expand and contract um, with changes in relative humidity, as will the canvas, but they will do them at different rates, both because they are different um, materials, but also the thickness of the materials involved. So we can get, in certain conditions, we can get the, the canvas becoming very floppy, and this is actually not very taut canvas. And if the canvas becomes floppy, it's much more likely that the paint layers and the um, ground layers will start to delaminate um, and cause and, and have the, the potential for uh, paint loss. A stretcher has keys in the corner, and that's an example of a key just there. And that allows the conservator on an ongoing basis to adjust the tension in the canvas so that we don't have the canvas getting floppy. So that if we do experience fluctuations, we can make the adjustment. Ideally, we don't experience the fluctuations, or certainly not rapid ones. With watercolours, um, relative humidity, and, and both watercolours and paintings, the, the changes in relative humidity will call, cause those physical dimensional changes, and that can happen with, with um, watercolours as well. And I will show you um, how we mount watercolours, or how we generally mount colours, to try and prevent um, some of those things happening. If a watercolour is stuck down to a backing, um, a backing board, which we often find um, framers or some framers will in the past and some in the present will actually stick things down to backing boards. And what happens then is you have a differential reaction in the same way as the canvas and the timber to it changes in relative humidity. So sometimes you will see um, watercolours that are bowing like that um, because and, and there's an additional layer of the glue there, which, and they all react differently, so they will have a dimensional change. Um, we, there are some times where, rarely, but we do see things that get split because of the, the, that change. Um, the other big one in terms of relative humidity for both paintings and um, watercolours is above 60% relative humidity, you are likely to get mould growth. And mould digests the thing it's growing on. It's basically sitting there eating away at what is was underneath. Mould growth on paper can be really, really damaging. Um, in fact, you can actually lose the strength of the, in the paper um, and really end up with just a pulp um, in the area where the mould is growing. 
it's, equi it's, it's extremely damaging to paintings as well, um, but perhaps um, you've, got a, you've got a little bit more time once you get some mold growth on a painting rather than on a, on a, a watercolour. I just want to go back to light again because I think, um, again, we have something in common with, with both paintings and paper in that light will affect the pigments. It will actually um, cause fading and it will cause discoloration. Paintings are considered a bit more stable than, than watercolours because they also have that varnish layer and some of the, and the, and the binder that the water, the, um, sorry, the binder that the pigments are in in the paintings is a much more um, robust material. I haven't mentioned that, so I'll just talk about that quickly. Um, the binder for the pigments in, in paintings is, in the case of oil paintings, is basically like a linseed oil, a bit like what you put on cricket bats, um, and it is called a drying oil. It dries by evaporation, but it is a very complex um, polymer, and it, it has a chemical reaction as it dries, um, which means that it, it forms a very... Um, a very, t um, it's like a varnish, it's a varnish in, in fact, it's, it, it creates a layer that is hard and protective. Um, the gum arabic does the same, but it's a much lighter, um, um, much more, it remains more soluble, it will remain water soluble for a long time, whereas this becomes less, it, it is not water soluble to start with and then it becomes less soluble and as it ages becomes less solvent in all sorts of solvents, organic solvents that we might use. So what can you do to look after your own watercolours and paintings? I hate saying it, but it always comes down to housekeeping. <laughs> Housekeeping is vitally important. Um, keeping things clean is really, really important. Um, dusty storage areas um, aren't just dirty and dusty, they also attract insects. Um, high relative humidity and dirt really attracts insects, they love it. Um, for paper-based items, um, silverfish are one of the key insect um, pests that cause damage. And they like nothing better than dark, pokey spaces with lots of dust. Um, a significant percentage of dust is human skin flakes. Not nice, but it's true. And that's a lovely little bit of protein for insects to sort of hang around and eat. But the other thing is that they also like to eat paper. They like to, we've got a lot of cellulose in here. We're basically talking about food. This is food. Um, the uh, you'll find on some some objects, um, some insects will actually eat particular types of pigment areas or bits that have got particular binders in them. So you can actually just sort of get grazing. Um, I don't know if you've ever left um, something with a label on out in the garden and seen what the snails do to it. That's one of those things where that's probably got a starch starch in it and um, they just love going through and just having a, a chew on that. So you've really got to keep things tidy, keep things clean. Minimise the fluctuations in relative humidity. That's not always easy to control. Um, even the best air condi conditioning systems um, have difficulty in maintaining a flat line relative humidity, particularly with temperature changes on the outside. Um, one of the things you can do is buffer things by putting things in layers, layers of protection. So, for example, if you're not displaying your watercolours, um, a box like this is a really good way to store them. Um, in a lot of organisations, including here at the um, National Museum, we keep the um, we keep things in standard size mounts. We're able to then put them in standard size boxes, um, and then we have a really good buffer against changes in relative humidity in the storage region. The relative humidity here and the temperature here will be quite different to what's in that box and what the items are subjected to because you've got an absorbent material here in the box and then you've got layers and layers of absorbent material with the, um, the mount board. So everything is buffered against the relative humidity. The other thing with this is that if you're not displaying things, it's really good to get them out of the light. Once the chemical damage caused by light starts to happen, it's irreversible, it will continue to happen, but we can slow it down. Basically, conservators in the, in the business of looking after cultural heritage 
are not performing miracles. We're just slowing down the rate of change to try and keep things longer. For paintings, um, there's a lot you can do for paintings, and I think there's a lot with these where um, a lot about handling, um, how you handle them. I'm just going to turn this one round because just to demonstrate some do's and don'ts. Um, when you're handling a painting, never put your hand fingers underneath that. Um, try to stay away from that area um, and because you can actually distort the canvas, but you can also then stretch it a little bit so that you get more dirt and um, insect activity inside. Um, when we, when we put canvases on display um, and also when we travel them, we try to have a backing board on them. Uh, we use a light archival um, material and we attach the backing board um, to the stretcher or strainer so that that will prevent or reduces the, the, the risk of insects getting in there and it protects the back of the canvas from impact. So that's a really good way to do it. I would suggest that um, it's something that it's worth getting a conservator to do. Um, but it is a really nice one way to do it. The other thing is that when we are putting them onto, this is a really difficult one to see because this is a work in progress. But when we um, the stretches and uh, sorry the stretches we use usually have a beveled edge in here. You often see paintings where you look at them and you can see on the front of the painting the edge of the stretcher or strainer showing through. So we ha we get a beveled edge there so that we're not getting that. Um, impact. Um, the other thing we can do is once we've got the backing board on, um, put handling straps there so that you're actually handling, you're not handling the canvas directly, but you've got straps there that allow you to lift it. If you've got a large painting, really, pl well with anything really, but particularly with large items, plan your movement. If you're going to move it from one place to another, make sure you've got enough people to lift it. It's not just about looking after your own self, manual handling, um, aspects of the of the job but also looking at making sure that you've got enough people to lift the item so that you're not going to drop it um, and also plan your movement so that you know that where you're taking to is clear and that you've got somewhere to place it. When you do move it and if you have to stand it against a wall it is always a good idea if with framed items to stand them on blocks. Prepare some wooden blocks, stand them on blocks. If there's something spilt near them they're not going to get the immediate effects of that unless you have a sort of a big flood coming through, but if you have them on blocks, then you've got your your um, your frame and your item protected. Framing watercolors and mounting watercolors. I'll just pull this one out. I think I've got yes. Um, I spoke about the way that um, watercolors can, uh, if if watercolors are stuck down, they can distort because of the differential movement between the backing board and the watercolour. So what we do is we, we tend to hinge them. And this will probably be quite difficult to see. But just to let you see this, that little item is not stuck to a backing board. We're allowing that to move as it naturally will with changes in relative humidity and temperature. So we've got, it's hinged, it's got a T hinge. There's a hinge running vertically that's stuck to the back of the item. It's a Japanese paper. Um, and you can actually buy Japanese paper that's already gummed with a, an archival gum. So you don't actually have to prepare your own. It, it, it can be bought. Um, and it's basically what we do is we try to tear the edges so that they, um, they don't create a hard edge on your, on your work. So it's one that way. And then we don't stick the, the work to the board. We use the top of the hinge and we put a T hinge across at the top of the T. So that holds the, the thing in place. On either side of this, we have an archival mount board. This is a board that is of high quality paper pulp and it will not, not discolour and it will not cause acids to migrate into the work. We have a window mat that is hinged to the backing board, not stuck down to the backing board. So that allows us to actually get to it and do what we need to do if there's some adjustments to be made or if we need to condition check it and see that it's stable. A mount has a bevel. You'll always see, or well pretty much always see, a bevel on the mount. That's an aesthetic, generally an aesthetic thing, because when items are on display, that bevel doesn't cast shadows on the work. So that's a really important thing. But the window mount performs a really important function in terms of preservation. And here we have a little watercolour. 
it's framed and the watercolour is against the glass. It doesn't have a window mount and it doesn't have a spacer between the item and the frame. That can cause real problems because if you get changes in relative humidity, you can get condensation inside the frame. That condensation can either promote mould growth or it can cause colours to run if the, if the, um, if the colours are still soluble, if the pigment, uh, the, sorry, the watercolour is still soluble. Um, I have seen instances of photographs stuck to the glass where um, we just could not separate them. Now that was, is unlikely to happen with a watercolour that it will become permanently stuck, but you can certainly have loss of image because some of the colour can stick to the glass. So it's really, really important um, in looking after watercolours and anything that's framed with glass is that you have a spacer between the surface and the, and the actual item. This is one of the things that window mount does. If you want to display it like that without a window mount, you need to put a spacer around the edge of the rebate. Generally, when you're handling things, always make sure they've got a support. Um, this is what you don't do. This is quite a, uh, quite a you know, sound piece of paper, but you always move things on a support. That way, you're not handling them directly, and if they are vulnerable, if they are brittle, or if they're liable to crease, you've actually got something there supporting them and keeping them really nice and solid. So there's some really simple things that you can do. Um, I think it's, you know, really be aware of your environment. Try to buffer things. Try to make sure that when you're storing things that they are um, protected from rapid changes in relative humidity, um, high and low temperatures. Layers of storage are really important. Um, with watercolours, um, if you're displaying them, think about where you display them. Don't put them opposite windows. Try not to hang anything on an outside wall where you may get temperature changes and relative humidity changes. Um, think about perhaps not having watercolours on permanent display and giving them a rest every now and again and letting them um, just be out of, the, uh, out of the light for a while. Avoid direct sunlight, avoid UV. Um, a lot of um, fluorescent uh, tubes will emit UV. Try to avoid that. Equally for paintings, it's not, as, it's not as crucial in terms of the fading, but some pigments can fade, some glazes will fade. So again, the same principles apply. Handling, handle with care, always provide support. Um, try and understand what you're dealing with and what the, the nature of these things are. They may look very robust, um, they aren't always. Um, even something like this, something on a board. Um, the museum is about to have a, um, an exhibition of bark paintings. Um, and one of the things that we've had to really look at with the bark paintings is that they, the bark is similar to a, board, a, a painting on a board. Um, it can flex and change with relative humidity changes and it can split so that you can end up with, with barks that, uh, and, and I've seen this with panel paintings as well, where they're just split completely because of that change. So although it seems like a really solid material, a lot of these materials can still be quite vulnerable. It's about thinking ahead, it's about housekeeping. Um, and I think the other thing is if you do have a problem with watercolour or a painting, um, don't attempt to treat it yourself unless you really are experienced because um, you ca there can be problems with those sorts of approaches if you don't understand what you're dealing with. Um, better to consult a conservator and see what might be done um, and get some advice um, so that they can actually really give you a solid way forward to, to care for your items. Are there any questions? You mentioned um, the backing, the Japanese paper for the watercolours and the backing for the paintings. Um, where can you buy these supplies? There are a number of suppliers um, of archival materials. Um, I'm just trying to think of the names of them right now. Um, archival Survival is one of them. Um, and there's, uh, I think if you, if you look up, if you, if you Google, um, Conservation Preservation Supplies um, Australia, you'll find that there are a number of companies that, that supply these things. Some of them specialise in one area, some specialise in other areas. Um, so you'll have one that will perhaps supply mat board, others that will supply this sort of um, 
this sort of board, this is a foam board with paper on either side um, that, that's an archival quality. Um, so you really just have to go searching through those, but there are a number of companies. Um, some, of the, some of the things that we use, we have to import, but that's very rare these days. There's a really good supply of um, materials. Um, and if anyone's um, really would like a list, we, we can put a list of um, suppliers on our website, on our conservation pages, so that people can can um, find them. The AICCM, which is the Australian Institute for Conservation of Cultural Materials, does have a list of suppliers on their website as well. Uh, hi, Vicky. Um, I just want to say thanks for the uh, wonderful talk so far. Um, I do have a question for you. I have an Aboriginal bark painting at home. Uh, it's not framed as I don't want to take away from the aesthetic of the bark. Uh, will it damage the painting to have it mounted um, without glass? I think it's really good that you don't have it framed. <laughs> <laughs> there have been a lot of um, framing techniques um, for bark paintings over a period of time and they used to be attached to canvas. There was a period um, where um, some quite heavy, um, heavy in terms of the size of them, um, moulded mounts were made for them to support them. Um, and displaying bark paintings these days is to provide a very, very light support that allows the bark to move in response to relative humidity and, and temperature. Um, we don't glaze them. I think the other thing with, um, with something like a bark painting or anything that's got sort of fairly friable media, um, you have to be careful of your glazing material um, because you don't want to have a very chalky ochre um, attracted to static that, that gets built up on perspex. So you can glaze with glass or perspex, but you really have to be careful which one you, you're using and the distance you have it away, particularly if it's perspex, away from a friable media. In saying that we allow the bark to respond to relative humidity and temperature, we do that in um, the museum because we do have a reasonably good control over um, the environment here because there's significant investment in, in air conditioning and relative humidity um, control. Um, in our storage areas, we actually store the, the barks flat in plan chest drawers or deep plan chest drawers um, and we have uh, boards in which we can pick them up and, and carry them around. Um, so that again is a, a form of buffering from the environment. So you do really have to be very careful to make sure that the environment you're, you're displaying it in doesn't have massive fluctuations, rapid fluctuations, because that's when you'll start to get the splitting. And that would be the same with any board. And certainly with canvases as well, you'd have a problem. Hi Vicky, I have a question. Um, at home, I have an acrylic on canvas that is stretched and above a fireplace. Will the fumes and heat from the fire damage it? It was recommended not to frame it as it would be too heavy. Is there anything I can do to look after it other than move it? Um, I would move it. <laughs> if your fireplace is one that you use, I would move it away from there because what you'll get there is you'll get... Um, it's not so, the fumes can affect, and if, if it's an open fire, is it an open fire? You, yeah. Yes. Well, you could get the soot, um, and soot can be quite difficult to remove from the surface of paintings. Um, takes a lot of work after, say, a fire to actually move, remove soot because it's oily. It's oily and it's got particles. It's bla basically black pigment with oil, and it sticks. Very difficult to, to remove. Um, and... Um, the main thing there, I think, is that you will have heat. So you will have um, periods of the year where you haven't got heat, high heat, and then you'll have a very dry environment above the fireplace and it will be quite hot. I would say don't, I wouldn't hang anything there. Um, I wouldn't hang a watercolour there. I think you really need to put it somewhere else where it's got a much, um, much less chance of that, that extreme um, change over a period of time. Um, is it, is it a, a dot painting or is it just a, um, an acrylic? Just a, yeah. Sorry. Yes, it's a dot painting. It's a dot painting because one thing that can happen with the dot paintings, the, the dots are known to fall off at times. So you really have to be careful of that because they're little individually placed dots 
and so they and they're usually on top of another pigment, so they can actually fall off. So I would move it. Um, one thing I didn't say, and I will say for anything that you're hanging, any painting that you're hanging, hang it from two points. If one fails, it's still got something to hang by. If it's only on one, say it's a watercolour with glass, it falls, the watercolour, the, the glass breaks. You, I've seen a number of watercolours that then get little nicks in the surface. Um, if that f falls, it can break the um, stretch or strainer, can cause the, the um, canvas to get loose and paint can come off. So always hang with more than one. And if it's really heavy, if it's got a heavy frame or anything like that, think about how many um, points you're going to hang it from and also what type of wall you're going to hang it on. With paintings, s all artists use different techniques. <laughs> they use different things. I mean, paintings aren't just paint. Sometimes they're collage. Sometimes you get things stuck to them. Um, you know, there's artists are very Id idiosyncratic in what they put on things. So, and, and that's, you know, Aboriginal artists and, and non-Indigenous artists. So you, you can have quite complex um, things. You don't always get all the ground layers. You don't always get the, 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 the proper preparation. So my advice would be treat them all with exactly the same care, the same levels of care. Um, just a couple of things that I just thought of when you were talking then, because I know that we get a number of paintings at the museum that come unstretched and they're transported rolled. Um, and that can, that's really important too. If you are rolling paintings, um, they should be rolled on the outside of a roller, not put into a tube for posting. Same with watercolours, on the outside. You can do a lot of damage trying to get something out of a roller. Out of, a, out of a tube. If it's on the outside of a roller, you can put layers of protection as well. And also that way um, you won't get the same sort of distortion. And this is a nice little example here. Um, when you undo, un this has just been folded over like this. It was given to me by one of my staff the other day as an example. And that's what we have because that's been folded over, that distortion there. And we can't just sort of flatten that. We have to really ease that down over a period of time because we don't want to split the paint. If you're rolling a canvas, roll it with the paint side out. There's a reason for that. Because if you roll it with the paint side in and the paint cracks and you get compression, when you flatten it, you'll have a, a gully in the paint. If you roll it with the paint side out and the paint splits when it comes back together, it will not have that gully. It will still be split, but it won't be immediately obvious. Better not to roll them, but if you have to. Um, but yes, I would treat them um, with the same, the same care. Um, try not to put things directly on the surface, um, if you can, uh, or something that definitely something that's not going to, to stick. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>